It's Romans chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 4 to 7. We're going to focus in on them. But I'm going to start at verse 1, just for some context. And the sermon title is New Life in Christ. And this is what it says. What then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, having been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might work, uh, walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. Gerald Schur was struggling to convince his witness to testify. The year was 1961, and Schur, an attorney for the Justice Department, was interviewing an owner of a New York trucking company. The man claimed that Sonny Franzies, an underboss of the Colombo mob family, was extorting half of his profits from his business, and his men had not only vandalized his truck, but on one occasion beat him with bats until he agreed to comply. And the businessman was looking for a way out. Now, sure was more than willing to help, but he said that in order to do so, it would require the business owner to testify against Sonny Francis at his court case. No way, he said. I mean, even if Francis was put away, the mob would come after his family and him, and with no way to protect himself, he calculated the price to pay for justice was just simply too high. Well, it was at that time that Gerald Schur came up with an idea. What if the government created some sort of program where witnesses could not only be kept safe during the trial, but afterwards could be relocated and given new identities and be protected from retaliation by the mob? And at that point, the idea for the Federal Witness Protection Program was born. Now, passed as part of the Organized Crime Control Act of 1970, it gave attorney generals the ability not only to provide protection for witnesses before and during the trial, but also to relocate them and give them new identities, uh, they and their families, afterwards. So what happens when you enter the program? Well, even before the trial begins, uh, your family is taken into protective custody. U.S. Marshals are going to show up at your door, and they're going to whisk you away. Most of the time, you have to leave everything behind at your house. Moving vans attract a lot of attention. And uh, agents take you to an undisclosed location uh, until after the trial's over. The second thing, though, you have to do is you have to get the witness to court. That might seem simple enough, but in cities where the mafia is active, there's usually corrupt police officers who are willing to tip off mob bosses. In his book, Witsec, uh, Gerald Schur tells how witnesses he saw brought to uh, court by mail trucks, by boats, by helicopters. And uh, he said on one occasion they took... uh, a witness, and they, they brought him in an armored car with police escort, but he wasn't actually in the car. That was just a decoy. They brought him in through a side door. Well, after the trial, the government provides you with a new legal identity. You receive a new name, a new birth certificate, driver's license, and passport. They suggest that you keep the same first name or the same initials, but I don't think I would do that if I were them. I would change my name from Doug McConnell to Albert Finkenstiel for sure. Well, the feds uh, then move you to a new state or city, sometimes a small town. They provide you a home and help you to secure a job. So if you were an attorney before, you may end up a Walmart greeter afterwards. Now, the feds can do their part to keep you safe, but you have to do yours as well. Once you enter the program, you can never go back to your home, never contact former family members and friends. It's best if you destroy all your records and old family photos to erase any former, uh, any evidence of your former life. So as far as you're concerned, your past identity has been completely forgotten, replaced by a new identity and a new life from that day forward. Now, I thought about the Witness Protection Program as I was preparing my sermon because in some ways, becoming a Christian is like entering the Witness Protection Program. When you become a believer, your old identity and your old way of life has to give way. It's replaced by a new identity and a new way of life. New life in Christ. That's what we want to talk about today. So to do that, let's pray and ask God's help. 
And Father God, I do pray for grace and mercy. Help us to see uh, the peril in the situation and what it is you've done for us and when we believe in Jesus Christ. So bless us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, every religion and philosophy in some way has to address the problem of evil, uh, both in explaining its origin and uh, finding some way to overcome it. The Greek philosopher Socrates believed that the root cause of evil was ignorance. Uh, people did what was wrong because they didn't know the right to do. So if a person is simply educated, he will see the errors of his way and he will do what's right. Salvation through education. Ban banish ignorance and uh, errors will go away. But uh, D.L. Moody was right when he said, if you have a man, a young man who's stealing rail ties from the rail line when he works there, if you send him off to college, when he comes back, he's going to steal the whole railroad. Many of the Nazi leaders were highly educated men, and the profession of German doctors were among the most ardent supporters of Hitler. Well, if knowledge isn't the answer, perhaps uh, law is. Well, certainly law, particularly those with harsh sentences um, for breaking them, will restrain some evil. I mean, the city-state of Singapore, if you go there and you spit on the sidewalk, you can be fined $500. If you litter, you can be fined $1,000. If you use a public toilet and forget to flush it, you can be fined $150. That's a clean city, but quite a cost. Now, back in 2015, a 17-year-old British man who was working for a Saudi oil company, uh, had been there for 25 years, was found in possession of some homemade wine. He spent a year in jail and faced up to 350 lashes of a whip. But let me ask you a question. Do stern laws and stiff penalties change a person's heart to desires? Did Israel's righteous laws given by God make them a holy people and a just nation? No, you read through the prophets in the Old Testament and see how they denounce both the leaders and the people time and time again for their corruption. But if people cannot be made righteous by striving to keep the law, then how do they become righteous? Well, Paul's argued in the last chapter that they become righteous by receiving Christ's righteousness by faith as a gift of God's grace. But, Paul's Jewish opponents would argue, if a person is not restrained by God's law, what's to keep them from plunging even deeper into sin? If God shows his glory by forgiving sins, we shouldn't, or shouldn't we just sin all the more so that he has an opportunity to show his glory by displaying his grace? Now, Paul was disgusted by this kind of perverse logic. Obviously, if God hates sin, which he does, then nothing he does in giving that grace was intended to bring about more sin. Rather, Christ paid for people's sin on the cross, and then by breaking that dominating power of sin in the life of the believer, people are brought into righteousness. But how does he do that? How does he, how does he give us this new life in Christ? Well, he does it the same way they do it in the Witness Protection Program. He replaces our old identity in Adam with a new identity in Christ. So what do we see in this text? Well, the first thing we see in the text is the reality of this new life. The reality of this new life. And this is verse 4. Now remember the question with which Paul starts this chapter. Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? And Paul's answer is, may it never be. It's the, he, he makes an utter and complete rejection of such an absurd question. For Paul, it was inconceivable that anyone would think that God's grace would, should, or could result in an increase of sin. I mean, for Paul, the idea that a true believer who's been justified by faith would continue in a lifestyle of sin was not only unthinkable, but he considered it impossible. He asked, how shall we who died to sin continue to live in it? But in what sense has the Christian died to sin? Well, it's certainly not true that we've died to sin in the sense that we never again fall into it. Christians sin not only before they became believers, but we sin sadly even after we become believers. James, in writing to believers in his time, said we all stumble in many ways. When Paul says in Romans 6.21 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that's true for us even after we are believers. You see, the Christian hasn't died to the tempting power of sin, but we have died to the dominating power of sin. In World War II, the German army besieged the city of Stalingrad for five months, and they hammered away at it, uh, starting in August 23rd, 1942. But uh, they were not able to take the city. As a matter of fact, they not only failed, but in the end, the 6th Army under von Paulus had to surrender to the Russians. That was the turning point of the war. The battle broke the back 
of the mighty German Wehrmacht, from that point on, everybody knew what the outcome of the war would be. Many battles yet had to be fought, but the victory was now guaranteed. Well, the Christians faced many battles against sin in their lives. But the outcome of this war was already settled in AD 33 when Jesus died on that cross. So sin remains in the life of the believer, but it doesn't reign in the life of the believer. Why? Because that dominating power of sin was broken by Jesus when he died on the cross. Because when he died on the cross, we died with him. That's the truth that stands behind verse 3 when Paul says this, Or do you not know that all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we've been buried with him through baptism into death so that Christ, as Christ, was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. John Piper, commenting on these verses, says this, There's a union between Christ and the Christian so that what happens to Christ is counted by God as happening to us. His death is our death. God establishes this union, as it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 30, but by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. So God establishes a union between the believer and Christ in a way that makes it fitting for him to count Christ's death as our death. We're in union with Christ, and so we died when he died. We're in union with Christ, and so we, we rose when he rose. And that union in his resurrection provides the power for the believers to walk in newness of life. I was recently talking to someone and uh, he told me that he's been in and out of counseling his entire life. And I asked him this question. I said, did you think it did you any good? He said, no. Counselors cannot fix our problems. Only God can. The band Moody Blues had a song where they had these words in it. I'm looking for someone to change my life. I'm looking for a miracle in my life. Well, that miracle comes when we put our faith in Christ so that his death becomes our death and his resurrection provides us with the power to live a new life. As Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.15. So there's the reality of the new life, but secondly, Paul speaks of the certainty of this new life. Now, Benjamin Franklin said, the only thing that's certain in life are death and taxes. But is death certain for absolutely everybody? I mean, there were two people in the Bible who never died. Who were they? Enoch and Elijah. And Paul tells us that that last generation of Christians who are alive when Jesus comes back are not actually going to die. He says, we will all change, but we won't all sleep because they will be transformed and given new bodies without first dying. And how about taxes? Is tax, are paying taxes inevitable? Well, Leona Helmsley, uh, a billionaire hotel owner, known as the Queen of Mean, uh, told her housekeeper one time, we don't pay taxes. Taxes are for little people. But evidently the IRS didn't agree. She was convicted of tax evasion and she went to prison. She eventually paid. On the other hand, Erwin Schiff, who's the father of Peter Schiff, the economist, um, he refused to pay his taxes because he thought income taxes were unconstitutional. But he couldn't convince the courts, but he still stuck to his principles. And so they sent him to prison three times for refusing to pay. He finally died at age 87, still behind bars. But for Paul, the reality of the new life is a certainty for those who've been joined to Christ by faith. He says in verse 5, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now it's really important we understand something here. The Christian life has what we would call, the theologians call, an already not yet component to it. For instance, believers are already in the kingdom of God, and yet it's not yet been established on this earth in its fullness. Christians already have eternal life, and yet the fullness of that experience awaits our resurrection. So John uses an already not yet approach in one of his passages, too, where he says this, See how great of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it didn't know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, but it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself even as he, meaning Christ, is pure. So here Paul says that our being united to Christ 
and his death guarantees that we will someday be united with him in a resurrection. There's a, that's the not yet part. But even now, the power of that resurrection comes into the life of the Christian so that we can live a life of righteousness. So just as certainly as Jesus died and rose again, we as believers died to the dominating power of sin and were raised by his resurrection to a power of new life which will culminate in the resurrection where we'll be given new bodies with no capacity to sin. And at that time, we'll actually be sinless. That brings us to the third point, the means and the purpose of this new life. And that's found in verses 6 to 7. Paul says this, Knowing that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who's died is freed from sin. Now three questions need to be asked of the last two verses. The first one is this. What is this old self that Paul is talking about here? Secondly, what does he mean that the body of sin is done away with? And third, what does he mean to be freed from sin? Well, that first question, what is our old self that Paul says was crucified. Now here I think the King James Version actually is a better version because it translates the word not old self, but the old man, our old man. But what's Paul saying by saying that our old man was crucified? Well, remember earlier, Paul was drawing a, a contrast between Adam and Christ as the heads of two humanities. All who are connected to Adam by birth are subject to sin and condemnation and death. But all who are connected to Christ by faith are subject to life and righteousness and justification. So the old self that was put to death is our former identity in Adam as his fallen children. And what replaces it is our new identity as the children of God, which comes when we trust in Christ. And this change of identity, folks, brings a radical change in our lifestyle. Think of the Apostle Paul. When he was still in Adam, he hated Jesus and his followers. But what happened to him when he was converted? That old man, Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, died. And a new man, Paul the Apostle, the promoter of the faith, came. Speaking of his death and his new life, Paul wrote this in Galatians 2.20. He said, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The means of bringing in this new life was by crucifying that old life. The purpose for God doing that was that in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who's died is freed from sin. But what does Paul mean by body of sin? Is Paul saying that the body human body is innately evil? That's what the Greeks believed. No, that can't be because God was the one who created the body. But sin has affected every aspect of our life, our bodies, our minds, our wills, our desires. And as a result of that, our bodies urge us on to sin. Now, historically, some have tried to overcome those urges by treating the body harshly. Martin Luther, when he was a monk, would starve himself, uh, and then he would sleep in a, a, an area where it was cold with no coverings. He would wear uncomfortable clothes and uh, many monks would beat themselves on the back with whips. I think it was Jerome who, when he was living out as a hermit in the desert of Syria, said all that time that his body was being roasted by the sun, he said his mind was back with the dancing girls in Rome. Now Paul debunked this approach to holiness In Colossians 2.20 when he says this, if you've died with Christ, and that's what he's arguing, we've died with Christ when Christ died, and it's become real for us when we believe. If you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of this world, why are you still living in this world? Do you submit to yourself to decrees like don't handle, don't touch, don't uh, taste, which all refer to things destined to perish. In other words, food laws and all that. He said, these matters, which are to be sure, have the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they're no value against fleshly indulgences. In other words, all these rules, all these regulations, and all this harsh treatment of the body can't overcome the evil desires. But what does Paul mean then when he says that as a result of this, this body of evil is done away with? Now, the Greek word can be rendered destroyed, made disabled, 
made interoperative. Again, I think we have to take an already not yet approach to this. Our bodies of sin will someday be destroyed. That's the not yet. Be replaced with resurrected bodies. We will die and our bodies are going to rot in the grave, eventually turning back to dust. For from dust you are taken and to dust you will return. But the already part is that sin is being disabled, disarmed, so that the Christian no longer lives as a slave of sin. So rather than sin dominating us, righteous dominates us. The reign of death has ended and the reign of grace has begun. Now, I have to tell you this. There is patience that is necessary on the part of believers towards themselves and others when it comes to this reign of righteousness. Because it's not a straight uphill movement. There's ups and downs in the Christian life. There's forward and backwards. But if you look at the trend line over time, there's real and dramatic change in the life of a believer. Well, what does Paul mean, though, then when he says that those who have died are freed from sin? Well, the word freed here is translated everywhere else in the New Testament as justified. Well, then why do the translators translate as freed here? I think it's because it seems to make sense of Paul's thought. I mean, if we're no longer slaves to sin, wouldn't that mean that we are freed from sin? Yeah, but I don't think that's what Paul says here. All right, let's translate it the other way. For he who's died to sin is justified from sin. Now, if that's the correct translation, what Paul's saying is this. The person who's died, the payment for sin has already been made. So years ago, when they would hang a person. By the way, do you think there should still be public hangings? You know, it's funny. We recoil at the thought of uh, capital punishment as a culture. And public hangings would seem to be over the top. But think of all the murders we do in silent. Abortions. Old people in nursing homes. There's 10,000 ways that we cover our sins. But at the time that they'd hang people in public, occasionally they'd put a, um, a notification in the paper later on. And it would say something like this. On October 5th, 1871, John Smith was hanged and so paid his debt to society. The law of God demands the death of the culprit. It cannot demand anything less, but neither can it demand anything more. For believers, because we were united with Christ, when we died, or when he died, we died. Therefore, the demand of the law on us for our sins was satisfied. And having died to sin, we're now free to live a new life, the new life that Jesus has given to us. But that begs the question, has that new life begun for you? If you have begun this new life, it was when you were born again by the Spirit of God. You see, it was at that time that the Holy Spirit opened your mind to understand the gospel. I don't mean just intellectually, but to grasp it and grab hold of it. And it was at that time that he opened your heart so as to believe it and to trust in it. And so he regenerated you, giving you this new life and at the same time providing you with a, a new identity. If you're a Christian, you have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer you who lives, but Christ who lives in you. So now the life that you live in the flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you. You know, if this is true, then what we need to do as believers is leave that old life behind and really embrace our new identity in Christ. Live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. But you know, if you haven't received this new life, you can if you had turned from your sins and turned to God through faith in Christ. Let his death for sin be your death for sin. And let his resurrection provide you the power to live a new life. I started my sermon talking about uh, Sonny Franzese. He was a nasty man. 
Uh, he finally died in prison. By the way, he told, he told the, um, the judge who sentenced him to 50 years, he said, I'm going to outlive that 50 years, which he did, but he died at the very end of it. But Sonny Francine had a couple of kids, a couple of sons, one of whom turned against him later on and testified against them, entered the witness protection program. But the other son, Michael, never did that, but something else happened to Michael. Michael Francine became a Christian. And now he speaks all over the country giving his testimony and witnessing to people in prisons and out of prison. It's interesting because he wrote a book about this entitled, I'll Make You an Offer You Can't Refuse. But folks, listen carefully. If you're not a Christian this morning, I'm giving you an offer you should not refuse. Because I'm offering you eternal life and eternal joy at the price of Jesus' death on the cross. And all you have to do is believe it and receive it. And it'll be yours. If you're not a believer today, God is making you an offer you should not refuse. Trust Christ. Let's pray. Our Father and God, it is by grace that we enter into your kingdom. It's only because we're born again that we believe these things. But the message goes out and the offer is made to all who would hear it and all who would respond. Our Father God, I pray for each one here and each one who's going to hear over the internet that they would have their eyes opened and their hearts softened and their spirits made willing so that they would come to faith in Jesus Christ because it's the best offer that will ever be made and it's an offer that no one should refuse. So bless us to that end. Give us the grace that we need for we ask in Jesus' name.